Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good, good. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you, Cheech, wherever he is. Great. It was heart moving. Your story is all our stories. Thank you, brother. Uh, I'm really honored to be here. I, as you can tell from the clip, I've been doing this work actually in prison for 40 years. And uh, I've been, I started at Chino Prison, creative writing. I've gone up and down the state. I've been to Folsom. I've been to San Quentin. So that people think, well, I've been there like I did time there. No, I was there to do poetry readings, to do talks, to do healing circles, and to teach writing. Uh, I am formerly incarcerated, but as you know from my story, I was saved, if that's the word, by the Movimiento, the Chicano movement, the mentors and teachers that went to my neighborhood, a poor ass neighborhood that nobody gave a hoot about. Somebody set up a little youth center there, and I showed up, and I didn't know what it was, so I broke in the night before and graffitied all the walls. <laughs> and, and then they showed up the next morning, it was a grand opening, and sure enough, there's all this graffiti. I show up to see my handiwork, you know, I want to see what I've done. And, and then they hired this young man, and they told him, hold that guy, call the police. We got him, you know, because my black castle was everywhere. They knew who it was. <laughs> so, but he did something different. And um, he talked to me. And he told me things that nobody had ever told me. And it took me a while, by the way, I didn't just cave into this guy. I told him to drop dead, I don't know how many times. <laughs> but he never gave up on me. And one day he came back with a book about Mexican murals. He says, this is what our people do. All these great murals, Diego Rivera, Siqueiros, and Orozco. And then he sh in the back was all these Mayans, temples, where t murals have been painted in and out. And he says, it's in your blood, it's in your DNA. Nobody ever told me that. Uh, because the graffiti wasn't tagging, it was very intricate. The lettering, it was very amazing, kind of. I, I, I don't want to say that because I'm not a great artist, as you might imagine, but I was putting a lot of work in there, you know? And he could see it. And he saw, but instead of doing that, why don't you do murals? I didn't know what he was talking about. I had dropped out of school, I was homeless, I was on heroin, I was in and out of jails, and this guy gave me the time of day. You understand what I'm saying? Nobody else would do that. And the reason why I gave him a hard time is because I knew don't invest emotionally in any adult because they will always walk away from you. So I'm gonna get rid of it now. Drop dead, I don't want to do with you, I don't know what you're talking about, I ain't no artist, get out of it. You know, because I knew they were gonna walk away. That's why young people don't invest in adults, because too many people walk away. Their parents walk away. I was kicked out of the house at 15. I didn't have family, I didn't have nowhere to go but the body. And here's this guy um, trying to show me something. I had a uh, talk with my wife about it because she, she didn't grow up in the gangs. She didn't know about it. She grew up in a barrio. There was 11 of her. That was her they were their own gang. She had 11 <laughs> brothers and sisters. Uh, but she didn't know this life, so she says, um, he was probably a smart guy talking to a stupid guy, which I don't really appreciate that. And I, I'm not saying my wife is out of it. She just, it wasn't her experience. So I told her, no. It was a smart guy talking to a smart guy. The difference was he had vision. He had an imagination, you understand? I didn't, my whole world was the body, that's all I knew. And all I knew was that if I died or killed for the body, that was the most important thing I could have done in this world. You understand what I'm saying? To die for my homies, that was the biggest thing I could have done. And I remember one time, we had an argument about it, where, you know, people were dying, people were getting killed. I said, dude, it's gonna be you. I said, I'm not scared of dying. That's what makes it harder to work with young people like that. They ain't scared of dying. We used to have this thing in the barrio that even bullets coming at you, you don't run. That's kind of a pendejada, you know, but I mean, <laughs> on the other hand, it says something about who we are, you understand? We were, I'm not scared. Come get me, do me a favor. You understand? And so he says, you're gonna have this, this you're gonna have a funeral like that, like these people that we're going through. And you know what I told him? I can hardly wait until the day of my funeral. That must be the best day in the world. The best day in everyone's life. Because everybody's sad there, right? 
the girls are crying, you didn't even think they liked you, your homies all sad, you know, your mama sad, then a pop shows up you didn't even know before. That must be the best day of your life. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not dumb, I wasn't a dumb kid, but my world was this, and I put everything behind it, and all I needed was a new imagination. And who does that? All they were doing was saying, don't do this, be a good kid, be a bad kid. I'm not gonna do that. Can you offer me something different? Hope I'm making sense. I'm not gonna be a good kid because those good, good kids were also lost. Please understand. Because you don't get in trouble, don't mean you're not in trouble. I know these good kids, the quiet ones, that won't argue, won't fight back. They're dying inside. And then you get surprised when they commit suicide. All kids are in trouble. Gang kids are in trouble in a certain way. And you see it. They're the ones that are overturning the table. They're the ones that are going to scream and yell down the street. They're the ones you can see are in trouble. So you think, I don't want nothing to do with them. And you're walking back into more trouble. What we need is a whole community approach that incorporates everyone. Not just the gang kids, but that girl who won't speak out, who's been abused at home. Or that kid who's got hearing impairment, nobody got time for him because he's not fully deaf. So the deaf community don't want him, and other people don't want him. Or these kids who just don't know who they are. What's my roots? Who am I? I hate being Mexican. You know what I'm saying? We gotta talk to all these kids. This gang problem isn't gonna be resolved by just working with gang kids. You gotta bring the whole community involved, everybody. But you can't let leave. How do you say, you can't leave the gang kids alone or out. They gotta be incorporated. And that's been my whole approach. And I learned this from my, my mentor, who my book always went, it's called Chente. If anybody's read the book, uh, if I recommend it. Uh, I called him Chente, His, he had another real name. Um, and you so you know, I just did a play of this book. I really think if you all really can, go see the play in Boyle Heights. Go to East LA and go see it. It's at Casa 0101 because the play has now been sold out every weekend. It's been extended three times because people are going in there and they're, they're giving another sense of the story. Like I said, not just smart guy talking to a dumb guy. Smart guy talking to a smart guy. And I'll tell you one thing else that Chente does in the play, as he did in my book and my life. He wasn't saving me. He gave me the tools Knowledge, resources, relationships so I could save myself. You understand? That's more powerful. People think they're in this work to save people. Don't know you're not. Because then you're taking responsibility. I'd rather give that responsibility back to that young person. It's your life. I will help you in any way so you can live a full, complete, healthy life. But you got to own this. You got to make it yours. And I tell people, say, well, meet me halfway. No, you got to meet me 100% because guess what? If you're not 100% in it, how can I be 100% in it? Halfway is not good enough. You got to be there for your life. And I know it isn't easy to get there if you're like me. And I think the funeral is the best day of my life. You really got to work at trying to change the imagination. Why do I think that's important? Because we never, never hardly work that way. Everything is practical. And I'm not against practical things, but I will set this up as an indigenous, native, Chicano man. I'll set it up in the right way. And for all those, and I'm not against any religious, I work with Christians, I work with Catholicos, I work with Buddhists, I work with everybody, because everybody is important. All religions are valid as far as I'm concerned. But my mother is Tarumara from Chihuahua. Anybody from Chihuahua here? You probably got some Tarumara in you, because everybody from Chihuahua has some Tarumara in them. And they're the largest tribe north of Mexico City. And they're amazing people, but they're also starving. They're being forgotten. They're being pushed out. And um, I went back to the Tarumana because my mother always told us, but she didn't grow up that way. She grew up in a, in a civilized community called the Tarumana in the city of Chihuahua, which was a ghetto. And in La Tarumana, there was drunks. There was people shooting at each other. There was people with diabetes, heart disease, everything you can imagine. If you go to the Copper Canyon, the Baraka de Cobre, where they're at, they're the healthiest people in the world. The traditional people are healthy. 
They walk and run for miles. They all mainly eat corn squash and beans, the three sisters. They are, they don't beat their wives or kids. As soon as they leave, the traditional lands become civilized. They're all messed up. So I go back to the Tarumana and I'll share something that I learned from the Mexica and Tarumana traditions. Imagination is the first important energy because it's feminine. And if you understand anything about how feminine and masculine works, the first energy is feminine. You understand what I'm saying? Before you can create anything, you have to imagine it. And if you believe in a, a creator, you know that the creator started with the imagination. And then the masculine comes in. How are you going to shape it? How are you going to make it happen? You understand what I'm getting at? I know, I got some people getting bored. I'm sorry. But this is important for me. I want you to understand this because you're not going to work with kids unless you have a great imagination behind it. They need a vision. They don't need to just be told, do this and not do that. Because we're smart. We know doing this isn't helpful. We know doing that isn't helpful. And just because you don't scream and yell, run down the street, it doesn't mean you're not in trouble. Give me something to keep me out of trouble. You see these guys in prison, you know they're in trouble, but I'm going to tell you something that maybe you're not aware. There's more trouble outside of prison than in prison. I know, I, I know some of you agree, which is good, because I want you to understand, but I want you to understand what I'm saying. There's more prisons outside than the guys sitting in public behind bars, because we have other kinds of prisons. Prisons of who we are, who we're not, prisons of alcoholism and addictions, prisons of relationships that are, are not healthy. We don't even know whether we're, we're coming or going, jobs are going. I mean, I'm really glad people are learning mechanics. I became a mechanic. To keep me out of all the big prison terms, I became a, a, plum, a, a pipe fitter, I became a millwright, I became a mechanic, big machines. I learned welding, I did it for 10 years. And then all those jobs went away in the 80s. LA was the largest manufacturing center in the country. Larger than Chicago and Detroit. They talk about the Rust Belt. We were the biggest Rust Belt in LA. All those jobs were gone. By 1984, 300 factories of plants died. Any, anybody from LA? Remember the GM plants of Southgate, the GM plants of Van Nuys? Remember the Bethlehem Steel plant? Remember uh, the Pico Union Ford plant, the Pico Rivera Ford plant? And you know what I'm talking about. There was so, there was so much industry. And I thought, I'm going to work in there. My biggest brightest day was I was married, 20 years old, my son was, gonna, was born, and I got my job at Bethlehem Steel. I had a hard hat, uniform, steel folk, toe tools, with the safety guy, I thought, man, I am sharp, I'm cool, I'm gonna live this, this be my full life for the rest of my life. It didn't last, but 1984, all those pants were gone. So where's the imagination that's gonna replace that? This is where you gotta think about it. I'm not against that. You learn mechanics, you learn anything you can, because there's still some jobs there. But whatever it is, we gotta imagine something bigger that incorporates all of us. Because if we don't, we're just following the scarcity thinking. That's why the indigenous says, start with the feminine. But you can't do nothing without the masculine. You understand what I'm saying? Because feminine is imaginary, it's the big picture, it's annoying, it's trying to touch the whole creative thing, it's like the egg before it gets fertilized. But what, how does it get fertilized? With masculine energy. Then you bring in practical things, then you think about how to shape it, then you think about how to make it happen, right? That's what creation is. And the step from every disorder is not order. Every chaos is not more order, it is creativity. We have to learn to be creative human beings. And that's something that we have that nobody else has. And I'm saying animals, because among native peoples, we're all related to everything. The birds and the trees are all we are relations. You know, we're the two-legged ones, right? But we have something. We can imagine our way through this. Amen. And I want community to be based on that instead of just forcing people into boxes. Everybody's telling us how to raise kids and how to deal with them, but then you got to make sure that you instill in them the fact that they can think through and recreate them every step of the way and also get the tools and, like I said, resources and knowledge and relationships to help shape that. I'm helping these guys. Some of these guys are never getting out. And I still want them to have a healthy, full life. You understand what I'm saying? Because the more they become more problematic, 
If they don't, even in the streets, there's you many you know. I'd rather that they try to be healthy, strong in there so they can help guide wherever they can. So I teach them all these things to help them go through what we call the hero's journey. Who's, who knows the hero's journey? There you go. I'm going to tell you real briefly what it is. I teach these guys this. The, the whole idea is that everybody can be a hero, men and women. So it's not just men. You think a hero is Superman. You think a hero is Batman. You think a hero whatever it might be, right? You got to be a special kind of person, right? Can't, not everybody's a hero. There's only one kind of Spider-Man. Well, this is a concept that anybody can be a hero. Because a hero isn't somebody that saves lives. A hero is somebody who's been through something, and when they learn, and when they capture, incorporate what they learn, they bless the community with their teachings, with what they've learned, with what they can do to help and change that community. That's a hero. You make the community better than the way it was. That's what you want to be. So here's what I tell them. You have to have, in your life, a nurturing world, right? San Roque Sam, it could be your mama, it could be your, your brothers and sisters, it could be the little body or home, it could be bad or good, but it's the nurturing world, the world you came born into. You didn't choose that world. The cars were dealt, right? And then somewhere along the line, you have to have a separation from that world. And sometimes it's a good separation. You go to school, you go to college, you get married, whatever it might be. Sometimes it isn't. You join the gang, you're in, you're in the body, you're in drugs, pretty soon you're in jail, you go to prison. You separate some kind of way, or maybe there's a lot of separation. You go to war. There's a lot of ways to separate, but you have to separate from that nurture world. But in that separation, you go through one ordeal after another. That's life. You can't escape the ordeals. Ordeals make a life. Who prepares you for the ordeals? Most of us that teach you don't have any ordeals. That's not living. Teach me how to prepare when they come in. Because our deals make a life. You gotta go through stuff. But here's the thing. How many people go through stuff and don't learn nothing? They're still the same people. They go through one terrible crisis after another and they haven't learned a darn thing. You know? So you have to tap into powers and energies from these ordeals. Know the energies are knowledge, awareness, what other people can show you. The powers as you realize, I have the capacity to do something about it. I am my own medicine. You understand what I'm getting at? I can learn self-regulation, but also self-healing and self-generating. That's when you tap into something. We don't all get there, but we all can get there. Who helps you get there? Everything you've been through. You can become something of power and strength and knowledge. I don't mean power over people. I don't mean ego over others. I don't mean bullying people. I'm talking about internal strength and solidity that we all need after you go through ups and downs. So how who teaches you that? But that's not the whole hero thing. Somewhere along the line, you have to make a return. And I don't mean just return back home and back to the body, though that might be. You're really returning back to yourself inside of you. And in that return, you have to be able to give back. Be a boon to the community, or that family, or that world. Bless the world for what you picked up, what you learned, and what you finally find to hard-earned effort can give back to others. You understand what I'm saying? Then you're a hero. That's a real hero. That's the ones that we need more of. That's what that guy Chen did, was a hero to some kid like me, who didn't have to give me the time of day, who gave him a hard time and wouldn't give up on me, because he also saw something in me that I couldn't see. And that's what's important, that you look again at these young people. Yeah, they're, they're young and screaming, they're jumping them down, they're calling you out, they're disrespecting you, they don't got no proprieties, but look at them again. There's an artist in there. There's a poet in there. There's an amazing, beautiful theater person in there. There's a dancer in there. You know what I'm saying? There's a, even a mechanic in there. And there's nothing wrong with mechanics, because I, I, I was arguing with this one kid that everybody's an artist. I was in this uh, juvenile facility, you know, this artist, and this guy said, I'm not an artist. I go, OK, well, what do you want to do? I want to be a mechanic. And I told him, don't you think there's art mechanics? 
If you ever had your car fixed by somebody who wasn't an artist, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this art, it can't like being, somebody said, I want to be a teacher, I want to be creative. Are you kidding me? Teachers are some of the most creative people in the world. And the ones that aren't, I feel bad for those kids. Everything has art in it. Expand your idea of art. Everything has art in it. We aren't, artists aren't a special kind of people, we are all special kind of artists. That's what we gotta teach our kids. Even the ones who are sitting in crystal meth or in fentanyl and they're suicidal, homicidal, even the ones you think are completely lost. This is why I work with men like these and women like that, because I go to women's prisons too and juvenile halls and all these people that nobody wants to work with because I can still see the self-regulating, the self-eating, and the self-generating power they're capable of. And you gotta be able to see that too, because again, all young people are in trouble, they all need help, and maybe you don't work with these particular uh, kinds of trouble, but everybody needs it. And they all need your hand, and they all need your teachings. So, I wanna, I wanna open up a dialogue, so I don't wanna say too much. Uh, I can talk a lot, I have a lot of great stories, one thing you should know, my work in this area has put me uh, with um, peace treaties that I tried to do with the Chicanos in the 70s um, through the End Body Warfare Coalition, which was a statewide coalition that eventually got infiltrated, destroyed, and gone, like a lot of organizations. We were trying to have peace in the state of California, and they wouldn't let it happen. And as you know, the state of California is one of the most violent states when it comes to gang warfare and prison warfare and all this kind of stuff. We had an opportunity in our communities to change that, and it was undermined. We didn't quite get it then. And then, in 92, after, after the LA uprising, I went back to LA, I was living in Chicago, and I went back to LA and worked with the Bloods and Crips. They were having peace treaties. I did work with them. Some of those people I've mentored, now they're continual leaders, um, like uh, Akila Shirelles, like Dwayne Holmes, who um, I was working with, like um, a Bo Taylor, a lot of guys. Uh, but then I also started working with MS-13 in 18th Street. And I started doing that work to the point that I ended up in El Salvador in 93. And in 96, I started the first piece between MS-13 and 18th Street in San Salvador. People don't know this. I wrote about it. People ask me, this never happened. We broke it a piece with the mayors of various cities, with the National Police and MS and 18th Street United. Guess what? They got undermined by the Salvadoran government, but the other government was our government. And I don't mind telling you this because I saw it. The U.S. played a terrible role in undermining any gang peace. And then, I worked with gangs in Chicago to try to do a peace. We started to increase the peace network in Chicago. Chicago is violent now. It was worse in the 90s. And I was there in the, in the 90s. And one of the reasons why, because Cheech reminds me of my son. My son got caught up in the gangs, and he ended up doing 15 years in prison. And I was trying to save my son, and I couldn't give him again. I couldn't save him. Turned out he saved himself with enough mentoring and guidance. And I wrote him a letter every month, and I went to see him in prison. I did all this stuff. He ended up finding the resources within himself and ended up getting out of prison uh, almost nine years ago. Nine years ago, he got out. And just so you know now, my son is gang-free, crime-free, and drug-free. He's also mentoring for me, incarcerated, working with you. And uh, he's the same with me. Gaining circles at board and gaining permission because he got all these families. But uh, he also went to Los Padrinos uh, Juvenile Hall. He went to one of the, the LA Campos. So anyway, my son's helping. I'm really glad. That's why I named mean, my son Chief uh, uh, because uh, the, your story is his story. And, but anyway, the point is, it was rough in Chicago. But I did work with them, and that, that also got un undermined. And I'll tell you how. Just real quickly, we started peace zones within certain neighborhoods. Rival neighborhoods, we got the rival gangs to agree to not do drugs and have peace. But the community also had to agree, get them jobs, get them back into schools, and why they want to go to schools, get them sanctuary in the churches, because we got churches to help create sanctuary situations, and to get the police to not harass them. And unfortunately, in Chicago, the police were the first ones to not go along. They wanted to keep harassing them. And they pretty soon the business people said, we don't have no jobs. And then the school had zero tolerance. And they want to open up a school program. And, and then the only ones that helped us was the churches that were having sanctuary for these youth. They're the only ones. But after a while, there was nothing. So guess what? The gang lines went up. Drug selling went up. They went back to it. I did the same thing in San Salvador, in El Salvador, 
in 2012. They had a piece between MS-13 and 18th Street. I met with them. We got a statewide, not statewide, a countrywide piece. You guys might have heard about it. The violence went from 14 murders a day to five murders a day. In some places, 40 to 70 percent drop in violence. And guess what happened? They got undermined. The government of El Salvador, but also pressure from the United States again. And I think people don't believe me, I'll tell you really quickly how that was. I went to San Salvador the next year to speak to the Organization of American States to talk about the gang peace and how this was a solution to help the whole country get better. I went there and then they pulled me over, the OAS people, when I landed in San Salvador, put me aside, people from all over the Americas who was having this meeting. They put me aside and said, you can't talk about the gang peace. I go, why not? That's a good thing, I've been working with it. We created 12 peace zones, zonas de paz y seguridad, 12 of them in, San, in El Salvador, in which MS and 18th Street were working together. Community was doing gardening programs, mural programs, all kinds of good stuff, trying to get them jobs. And he said, no, they're all being banned, they're all being destroyed, and the U.S. government has pressured us. If we bring up the gang peace, they will remove millions of dollars from the Organization of American States. The U.S. government, you understand? And I was put in a bad position where I wasn't going to help them lose a lot of money. Uh, they did let me speak on gang intervention in general, how to work with gang kids, but I couldn't talk about peace. You understand how terrible that is? We can have peace in our day, but we're going to have to control it community-wise. And I'm not saying we don't work with police. If the police officers understand that, work with fine, you're welcome. But you got to do it on our terms, community-led. I work with anybody as long as they still keep focused on peace as possible and the Peace has to be done with actual gang members determining that, that they're going to be for peace as well as everybody else coming together and saying we will work for peace and making sure that everybody's taken care of. It's possible, but we can't do it with our own government. Now, I had a guy in prison, I just end with this, I had a guy in prison last week arguing with me about, oh, don't you love your government? Don't you love the United States? And I go, dude, I was born here. I'm Mexicano as a las gachas, but the other side of it is that I was born here. This is my country. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to fight for this country. I'm going to fight to make this the best country possible. I'm going to fight for everybody to have equity. Nobody left behind. Not the BS that they say. I'll fight for that. I love this country. We should make this the best country there is, and it's not there yet. And if you've been to LA, you know what I'm talking about. All this development, all these big buildings, and all this homelessness everywhere. And you can blame Democrats, you can blame Republicans, they're all responsible. Because the biggest problem isn't them, it's us. When are we going to step up? When are we going to have the knowledge? When are we going to say we're done with this? We can have abundance. That is an indigenous concept. Abundance is ingrained in nature, and it's ingrained in our relationships, and it can be ingrained in our society. But there's a big disconnect between abundance in nature, abundance in our, ourselves, abundance in our relationships, and the way our society is run, because society is run on scarcity. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody has created an illusion for us that not everybody can make it. Somebody has created an illusion that says mortgages and borders and all these are real things. They're not real things. They're made up. They make them all up, and we all sit there paying homage to them. We can create a better world. You understand what I'm getting at? And the reason I'm just mad is because I have to go talk to these guys all the time and try to get them out of the terrible mess they got pulled into. And yes, they also played themselves. I don't take responsibility away from them. I tell them, you guys played yourself. You played into this game. But now it's time to stop that. Stop playing the game that somebody else created. Create your own place, your own world. Fight for the betterment of every one of us and every one of our kids. They need to be there to mentor these kids out of the gangs, out of the violence, out of the drugs. You understand what I'm getting at? That's what we need to do. Give people those tools and help everybody get to that point. Thank you all very much. If I talk too much tonight, I never used to talk it out when I was a kid. Now nobody can shut me up. So. Um, I want to have some questions and then you can tell me when it's in, but let's have some questions, a little dialogue of comments. Uh, you can challenge me, of course, I love that. I always tell the guys in prison, challenge me. You know? yeah, like, is, yeah. is the play only uh, running in Boyle Heights right now? So it's going to be running in Boyle Heights until it finishes its run. Right now they keep extending it. But anybody can license it. 
And when I say license, it's not going to be big bucks. I don't want to get the money to get in the way. But we needed to be licensed. You can do it in a university, a college, or theater. If you know anybody's got a theater and they want a license, and you get your own actors. I mean, we don't got a, a touring troupe group, but I will tell you why it's good about those actors. They're all street kids. One of them has been shot. Many were in gangs. Many of them, one was standing in the corner and the theater people brought him in there and became an actor. They're real good actors, but they know the street. So we got street kids to play these roles because a lot of our actors don't know what that life is like. I try to get these actors, equity actors that have been around, and they can't, they're nice Mexicans. You know? They're nice people, but they can't play that hard role. I can get Chiefs to do it, he'll do a lot better. <laughs> but you know, you need some, we got good actors, but again, you find the actors, uh, we'll work with you, anybody that wants it. They just, there's a licensing thing, and then you can do the play yourself. And so anybody, that, any college that's it's got to put some money, got to have a theater, you got to pay the actors, you got to do a lot of things. But people show up, it'll change their lives. I think Thank Ricardo, you. I think Ricardo, was, was going to do it or what? Yeah. Oh, we're down? Are we down? Yeah, I'm down. Right. Just make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> Establish a very solid community based group that can then work with mayors and work with police, even work with others. But we had to develop that, especially in Chicago, the Increase the Peace Network was a very important group because we involved uh, 12 communities uh, Mexican, Puerto Rican, and African American. And we, we involved their youth, their parents, you gotta involve their parents. And we involved uh, other members of the community, including, like I say, churches. There was uh, business people. You know, you got to make it a full, and then yes, solidify that group. We were taken, believe it or not, to peace conferences. We call it peace retreats, but also sweat lodges. You know what sweat lodges are? Native American sweat lodges, and some of them. I don't know anything about. It. Don't worry about it. I, I, I'm Christian. It, it doesn't change your relief system. It's a beautiful practice. So anyway, we, we got it all through that, and they did very well. And that's how we went to the city of Chicago. But again. Pressure from outside the city has undermined that. Increase the peace network is gone. And uh, now you know Chicago White just went up like crazy. And uh, so anyway, I, I, it, I think what you do is you get a solid community base. And again, whatever other people are involved, they should know this is community run. The problem with a lot of the mayor stuff, that especially in LA, is it's run by the mayor's office. They said no. And they have a direct connection with Homeland Security. No. I don't mind working with all these people, but you, you see what I'm getting at? The community has to lead it, and they won't give it to us. They think we're the dummies. That's why I say this sounds smart people talking to dumb people. They're smart people talking to smart people, and we have to be smarter than them. You know? So I would say build a solid community base and use that base to then reach out to these different other things going on. I hope that's helpful. That's what's helped me in the work I've done. Anybody else? In a perfect world, after you've done all you've done, what would be the conclusion of your vision? So one of the things that we created, and if you go to the San Fernando Valley, anybody know the San Fernando Valley? You, yeah, and you may not know there was actually a Mexican side to the valley, the northeast side. Pocoima is the heart of that. Pocoima is a rough and tumble valley ghetto. Nobody can tell me that it's not as urban and there's housing projects, there's all these gangs, Danny Trejo is from there, if anybody wants to know, you know. Uh, there is also, uh, right now, 40, like 50% unemployment. There is, uh, in the elementary school that my wife went to, and my youngest son, 25% of those kids are homeless. And mostly Mexican, Central America. There's still a significant African American group. The really reason I mentioned that group, because I started there, a community culture center bookstore for half a million people. The second largest Mexican Central American community in the whole country, they did not have a theater, did not have a movie house, did not have a bookstore. We created it. It's been there 18 years. So we established a base of operations that now serves 20,000 people. And we have 
every art you can imagine. But people say, well, art's a nice thing. It's also revolutionary. We teach him to talk, to dialogue. When uh, terrible things happen, like deportation, head of the deportation rates, we brought the community to help them, give them the backing they need, but also what can they do to get organized. In other words, make it a place where everybody can be at and feel comfortable. There's an open mic every Friday night. Young people have a place to go. And I just encourage having a base of operation. I know it takes a lot of money. I, it's very hard. I'm lucky in that, believe it or not, always running. The royalties for that help me start the Air Truth Just Center Kutura. I have flyers about it if you're interested, because if you go down there, you should see what we got. And uh, the Air Truth Just is named for my dear. So it's my family, your dear, my dear. And so the idea being that you can be call it for your dear. I don't have to be teaching you can name it wherever you want. But keep that base of operations going because that's now, now we started a trauma transformation, which I understand is the equity thing. We started a trauma tra transformation program that now works with the formerly incarcerated, with uh, the incarcerated as well as families of the incarcerated. That's how I got my son active in working with it. So we're working with all as many population as we can. So that's what I would say, get a beautiful base of operations. Yep. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, to the National President, um, you said you, you go to Chino, Folsom, and all these prisons, right? Well, I traveled those prisons también. And uh, what happened was, was uh, I enrolled in Lassie Community College when I was in Susanville. Uh, I, was, I planned on getting educated, right? Uh, doing something instead of always being in and out. Um, I get accepted into college. Three days later, a full-blown race riot kicks off. I go to the oil for 17 months uh, to work my college career. Is there like something that we, we could uh, collaborate with that, that how you go in and teach the yeah. arts um, to where we could we could go and and as, as college professors go up in the oil and, and talk to these individuals behind glass, yeah. you know, and, and continue their education and said, my, my escape from, from the oil those 17 months was through reading. Yeah. I read so many books, I, I escaped, I became these characters, and that was my escape from reality at the time. Um, but I just feel we could do something more out here going in there and giving these guys that opportunity. I, I've been blessed, man. Education is key, man. I, I love this college. You know, I just, I, 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 want, to, I want to save everybody. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, that's I great. Just, I don't know if, if you know, well, what there, you're doing. There is, as you know, the changes in California is because a lot of people, not just me, have been fighting for these changes. When I first started going to prisons 40 years ago, they didn't want me. Some, somebody had wanted me there, staff or some wars, but everybody, the guards, everybody was pissed off. The prisons wanted you there. Yeah. There's, most prisons didn't have program, nothing to do. And then you had the shoes, where you can have an indefinite sentence. Here's guys up to 40 years in the shoes, 26, 30 years. Terrible waste of humanity and time. All the efforts to change that was part of our struggle to get rid of the shoes, the indefinite time in the shoes, to give, to bring more programming. I remember when we used to have meetings, there were only five of us that were going to the prisons in California. The last meeting I went to was in Chino, it was a training, and it was just for that area, 400 people showed up. So now there's a more interest, and in fact, the CDC, which used to be the California Department of Corrections, is now what? The California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Now, they're not perfect. They got a long way to go, and he's proof that, yeah, they do this, but they still got reasons that they could tear down programs. So the next step that we're doing is trying to say, don't stop the programming. Whenever there's a lockdown and everything, I get it, but don't stop the programming. That's important, because they, they, they do that for a long time and they lose all their opportunities. Now they call what's called, they get credits for time off for coming to my classes. And if they don't get the credits, they don't show up, and maybe they had nothing to do with it. Because they locked down because somebody's got a beef, and they make it a racial thing, pretty soon they're all locked down. You see what I'm saying? So it doesn't, they don't even have to be involved to be caught up in it. So it's like they're losing all their points and losing their credits. So we're trying to set up a program now where they let me come in and others, even if there is a lockdown. It's not easy. But this is what I think is important to help change the mentality. As long as people are open, they should do what they can to provide those kind of 
resources, that kind of knowledge. So I'm with you there, and if we can ever talk some more, this is a statewide effort. I'll talk to anybody who come back here, talk to you, teach, and others that are trying to do this. We should be involved in trying to change the mentality. I'm also trying to change life without the possibility of parole. I've been in trying to change that. The, the, it's called the second uh, death penalty. Well, there's a lot of things that we're doing. And again, do people in trouble need consequences? Absolutely. They don't need, they don't need to pay the price for their life, or their whole life. One mistake, everything paid for always, never get over it. My son, he did some terrible things and he did his time, but he never stopped paying for it. Jobs he couldn't get, people that wouldn't bring him, help him out. So my thing is, you make a mistake, you pay your price, but part of the price has to be eating. Part of the price has to be programming. Part of the price has to be learning a job skill, you know what I mean? That's gotta be the price of being so messed up, give them the skills they need. So I, let's work together. Are anybody's interested? I'm willing to offer this uh, as a statewide thing because I'm working with people across the state. And uh, if people are interested, you can look up on my website, luisjrodriguez.com. There's a way to contact me. Um, there's a way to stay in touch with me about this. I would love to keep doing this. I've been doing this for years, and I've seen changes, and I've seen some terrible setbacks. But let's keep pushing forward. Thank you. Thank you. I will tell you, it wasn't that long ago. I was there to do a graduation for our writing class. We have a program from the Achutes there at CIW with this group called Roots and Wings. They do theater and creative writing. And I'm going to be back there in December for the women who are going to be graduating for the next class. Yeah. Uh, so I, and I'm trying to get there. I have a brown card, so I can go to CIW there. So I'm trying to get there to help one of the classes. Uh, the problem with me is that I'm so busy in traveling. Somebody said I was in, they, they caught me in Cuba last week. I was in uh, Germany. I was in Spain. Uh, and then I'm going to travel all over the country. I'm going to New York City, Washington, D.C. I'm going to New York, Santa Maria. I'm going to travel a lot. But I am going to go back to CIW. CIW, so if you don't know, is the largest women's institution prison in the state. It's also got hardly any programming. The women are left to their own devices. There's a lot of bad things going on there. And we got a programming with Roots and Wings to the Achutas in there with the women to teach them writing and theater. So I plan to be there. So thank you for bringing that up because we don't want to leave the women behind, by the way. They have less program and less help than the men. And they need help. And a lot of the women are in there crying and dying and hungry to be connected and to find resources. So thank you. We can't forget the women in our institutions. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Uh, maybe one more? Okay, one more. And I'll be around a little bit so we can talk a little bit later. Can I give a shout out? The Achuchas has really good tamales. Yeah. <laughs> so. so here's one bad thing I have to tell you. We don't have tamales now. <laughs> but the good thing is just so you know, where the Achuchas has got a small little place in a um, strip mall. We're trying to find our own building. We have a thing called Guayaba Kitchen now that makes healthy Mexican food. Healthy, good, healthy Mexican food. And it, and it tastes good because, you know, I've eaten healthy food and, or not that good, I'm diabetic, I think about these things. But guess what? Guayaba Kitchen makes great, beautiful tacos and lo que sea. Uh, and, and we're gonna have tamales again. Now we're, we're with the new space. Yeah, we have to, just so you know, they have teachers that had a lot of setbacks. We got pushed out of two uh, strip malls. They hired the rents. We're getting our rent hired again in the end of 2020. They keep messing with us. They don't really want us there. They rather have some business that makes money. We're a nonprofit. Nobody makes money but the community profits. They don't get that. And so we're going to find our own space. We need to have our own spaces. And you all need, and you might even have some, need to fight for your spaces. Need to make sure the city gives you the background, get a dollar a, a year for a building, get your own spaces, have a base of operations, and have a full community approach to everything you do. That to me will be the way to go. Gracias a todos. Thank you, everybody. I'll be gone for a little bit. Thank you.